Hello, my name is Steve D'Agostino, and my co-host Anne Fernald and I welcome you to the Twice Over podcast, because to teach is to learn twice over. In this episode, Oral History, we are joined by Mark Nason, professor of African American Studies and History at Fordham University, who shares his thoughts about the importance of personal narratives, the rich and vibrant culture of the Bronx, and how to stay connected with students during a seemingly disconnected time. Mark, you have been a faculty member at Fordham for a good long while. Almost everyone in this community knows you, but for those faculty members who may be listening or those listeners who aren't at Fordham, can you kind of introduce yourself to the community? Tell us about yourself and what you do here. Sure. Um, This is Mark Nason. I'm a professor of African-American studies and history. This is my 50th year teaching at Fordham. I came here in the fall of 1970 as a faculty member in the newly formed Institute of Afro-American Studies. And since that time, I've basically been in African-American studies and history and urban studies. uh, And my research is in all of those areas. Uh, In the last uh, 18 years, I have been running a very large community-based oral history project called the Bronx African American History Project, which has uh, conducted over 350 interviews, all of which are digitized and available for a global audience and has produced several books. And most importantly, uh, we hire a number of Fordham uh, undergraduates and graduate students to run the research project, which gives them invaluable experience some of which they take into becoming professors themselves. Because I have these amazing student researchers who have on their own started a a Bronx COVID-19 oral history project, which is actually producing an exhibit in the Museum of the City of New York, and which scholars all over the country have found out about and are connecting to. And this is entirely a student-run initiative, which is utterly amazing and inspiring. Totally amazing and inspiring. So do you want to tell us a little bit about how that, how did that happen? When did the conversations occur? My approach to the pandemic, when I saw that my students were really shaken up, I basically decided to make the experience of living through the pandemic part of the academic work in my courses. I wanted students to write about it, uh, reflect on it, to share their feelings with one another. And that was a very collective, communal, shared experience where probably the most exciting thing that happened in the class was students sharing their recipes. So to go back to how the Bronx African American History Project got started, I did a little research and what I discovered was amazing. There were half a million people of African descent in the Bronx, uh, the eighth largest concentration of urban African-Americans in the country, and they were completely invisible to scholars. There were no books, there were no dissertations, there were no articles. When the Schomburg Center did a book called The Black New Yorkers, in in 400 pages, there were three on the Bronx. No kidding. And also in the book, in a newly published book on the Bronx by Evelyn Gonzalez, there was almost nothing on African-American communities and history. So I said, when you have this larger population and they're invisible, how do you make them visible? Well, one of the ways is through oral history. Let's start an oral history project. I'm really curious about oral history as your means. And you just, I mean, you just gave us a good rationale for it, right? To make the invisible visible. And you, I mean, you, you can believe, I mean, Steve and I are doing a podcast, right? We're big believers in, you know, kind of what you can learn by listening to people talk, but you're an historian by training and an African-Americanist. And can you talk about what's special and important about oral history as opposed to, say, going into the archive and looking for documents? Well, let's go back to something, the history of slavery. When in, you know, the, the, up through the 1930s, even up through the 1960s, virtually all the documents 
more memoirs of uh, of uh, slave owners, or uh, their account books, you know, which indicated who was sold, or their diaries. It was all from that point of view. But something happened during the 1930s, which was my inspiration for the Bronx African American history. The Federal Writers Project of the WPA hired scholars to find people who had lived through slavery and interview them. 2,000 former slaves were interviewed. Those interviews were not used as sources up until the late 60s with the Black Studies Revolution, when you had all these scholars that universities were hiring, often as a result of sit-ins, who were starting to reconstruct the history of, of African Americans in the country. And they found this absolute gold mine of a source in these, the WPA slave narratives, which you know, in the years when I became a scholar, were becoming the preeminent source that historians were using to see what the world looked like from the slave point of view. Before that, you only had like five or six memoirs, like from Frederick Douglass or, uh, you know, you know, the, well, the well, right. You know, but, uh, um, there were a few of those, but here you have 2000. I was lucky enough to start doing my research at a time when people who had been in the Communist Party were no longer so terrified by McCarthyism that they were willing to talk about their experience. So I was in the right place at the right time with the right credentials because of my own 60s activism to be the, the person which probably 20 or 25 famous Black communists decided to talk to for the first time. So in my work, in my, the research which put me on the map as a scholar, oral history was central. I always backed it up with documents. Of course. But so because of this, when by the time I, I, I thought of the Bronx in terms of the WPA slave narratives, I, I got to find people willing to tell a story that nobody else heard or even wanted to hear. Because frankly, the scholars at Columbia and NYU were scared of the Bronx. They didn't want to go up there. In um, a cultural uh, group in the Bronx uh, called the Garifuna people. Mm -hmm. They are uh, people you know, uh, who originally from the Caribbean, uh, who were forced into exile in the coastal Honduras, Belize, Guatemala, and Nicaragua, with the largest concentration in Honduras. Uh, they're a Spanish speaking people of joint African and indigenous descent with their own language right. and very distinctive culture and musical tradition. So we, again, we were contacted by members of the Garifuna community who said, uh, you know, folklorist, archivist, musicians, we wanted you to do a project for us. So we've been doing that this summer all on Zoom. You know, who is, um, Part of that community is Cerecia Fennell, who is the founder of the Bronx Book Festival. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah. We have to interview her then. We do have to interview her. Yeah. Okay. She's very proud, a uh, Garifuna community member, and she's always shouting out to her people. And I think one of her, I don't want to speak for her, but one of her ambitions is as a writer, not just the founder of the book festival, but as a writer, is to represent her people in young adult fiction because it's a group that has very rarely been written about and she really longed to read about a Garifuna girl from the Bronx when she was a little wow, girl. Wow, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's really oh exciting. So, so you, give me her uh, your contact information. I will, I will, yeah. yeah. But, so we've, I've never been, so, I've been incredibly busy. I ju we just did an interview with the before this, it was all in Spanish where I could understand about a third of what was going on. Uh, with Aurelio Martinez, who's a famous uh, Garifuna uh, folk musician. And the person leading it is Lisa Betty, who is a doctoral student in history at Fordham. Right. And this is part of her, her doctoral research. Uh, also, Michael Pardis, a Fordham graduate uh, who runs uh, a big community organization in the South Bronx, is also Garifuna from Belize. 
it's it's sort of unbelievable. Like Zoom has allowed us to do a lot of things that we were postponing doing. Isn't that interesting? Because setting up an interview with Fordham, you know, where we we have a seminar room in the sixth floor is a big deal. I I I, I never interview anybody without feeding them. You have to have you know, the students with the cameras, you've got to get people through security. It's easier to set up interviews on Zoom. So we're going to, you know, we're going to be going strong. We're gonna, we have the Bronx COVID-19 Oral History Project continuing. We have the Alpha Kappa Alpha interviews continuing. We have the Garifuna interviews continuing. And we're going to be doing hip hop interviews. And God knows who's going to come to us next. <laughs> because it's not like I just sit here and it's like the community appreciates that a university is taking them seriously, that a university is giving their voice primacy. Can you talk to us a little bit more about the, the university's relationship with the Bronx from your perspective as a historian and, and based on your work trying to nurture and develop you know, the relationships that are integral to the success of your project? You know, as you know, we are a gated community. There's this great principal uh, of a elementary school in the Bronx that I work with. And he, when he came here to talk, he said, we always thought of the Fordham as the forbidden city, that it had nothing to do with us. If you ask, uh, would ask somebody with car service, please take me to Fordham University, they take you to Fordham Road and University Avenue. That's how separated we were, uh, especially, you know, in the last 30 or 40 years when we started recruiting kids from upper middle class families from all over the country. And it became a very different place from the commuter school that I started teaching in, you know, in the early 70s. So also, uh, unfortunately, a lot of students who come from upper middle class families have a, a negative stereotypes about the Bronx, which are reinforced all too often by people at Fordham who tell them the only safe place to go is Yankee Stadium, the zoo, the Botanical Gardens and Arthur Avenue, whereas the Bronx probably has more good, affordable ethnic restaurants than any place in New York, where it has great cultural centers, great parks, you know, so uh, it's a battle to get Fordham to claim the Bronx as a source of cultural vitality for everybody here. You just think of like, look at the music that's being created here. Even now, you know, Cardi B is the hottest artist in the country, but you also have Romeo Santos, uh, you know, who's this, uh, you know, globally famous bachata star, Prince Royce. There, there's so much out there. And a lot of this has to do with the parents of the kids coming from all over the country don't want Fordham telling their kids, explore the Bronx. They're afraid they'll get hurt. So I think that there's a certain caution. I think more and more of the faculty understand the vitality of the Bronx as a cultural resource and also are doing research on it. Academic affairs has never been the problem. What do you think we can do as members of this community to break down those stereotypes? So one possibility would be to kind of do the kind of thing that you're suggesting is have a part of the programming of freshman orientation be, you know, kind of welcome to the Bronx and look how exciting this is. And we're going to take you to this Mexican restaurant and we're going to show you some, you know, hip hop landmark. And we're going to show you something about Edgar Allan Poe. And we're going to, you know, really show you the, range and diversity, what else can we do as members? I mean, of the you know, we can have public events that that where the Bronx and Fordham students meet together. Like we had a plan last year for a big talent show called Mic Check, where we'd have Fordham artists and Bronx artists, you know, competing in a friendly way, you know, with hip hop, R&B, uh, you know, poetry, now, I think our plan is to do it as an online arts festival, you know, which also right. not only includes music, but visual arts and, and, and film. So I think there you want to organize public events 
to make people coming here welcome. Right. You know, and I've had, I can do it because I have a personal relationship built over years of trust, but we need to open this place up to events where people from the Bronx mingle and, and interact and share with, with people from this community. You know, tours and have cl classes off site. Like I'm having a class at Orchard Beach on September 22nd. The dean's office is getting us a bus. So we're having my Bronx class at Orchard Beach. This weekend, I'm uh, on Sat Sunday, if it doesn't rain, I'm doing a walking tour of historic Morrisania and going to this great Central American restaurant, Says Vecinos. We have, you know, uh, the chief diversity officer is in our corner. Everybody in academic affairs is on board with this. Right. You mentioned sort of the, the most popular or well-known sites, you know, Yankee Stadium, Arthur Avenue, the zoo, the botanical gardens. So for the listeners at home and around the world who may be contemplating a visit to the Bronx, what are your top three places in the Bronx that are sort of little known, but just really essential. City Island to eat seafood. The Bronx Museum of the Arts, uh, which is a free, great museum. I'm going to give a three restaurant visit <laughs> if, in a car. La Mirada, this amazing Mexican re restaurant in Mott Haven, which is uh, a site of uh, immigrant rights activism. It's owned by a family from Oaxaca of undocumented people. It has a Michelin star. Johnson's Barbecue, which has been there 60 years on 163rd between Union and Tinton Avenues, the most amazing ribs, chicken and sides. And if you say the professor sent you, you get double portions. We once weighed a $12 plate of ribs and sides and it weighed six pounds. <laughs> and then Seis Vecinos, this new Central American restaurant on 154th and Prospect Avenue. These are all within less than a mile of each other. If you like ceviche, if you like sopa mariscos, you know, uh, it's amazing. So it's the food, it's the Bronx has the best inexpensive ethnic food anywhere. Unfortunately, we were being discovered by all the food critics, but I think the pandemic has maybe saved us from imminent gentrification since so many rich people have left the city. Let me mention another amazing restaurant. It's called Al Aqsa, A-L-A-Q-S-A. -A. It's on Starling Avenue near Parkchester, where there's a large and growing Bangladeshi community. This is one of those places where there are 40 dishes on trays, each one looking better than the next. I've been taking people for there for years, and then the New York Times rates it the number one curry house in New York City. It's, it's an eating festival. So, Mark, one of the questions we, we're, we're getting towards the end of our time, and one thing we always like to ask people as we think about teaching is about a teacher that mattered to them. Can you think about someone who, who was your teacher or your mentor that really shaped the, the professor that you became? There was at Columbia this legendary figure named James Shenton, who was one of the greatest. He wasn't an amazing scholar, but he was one of the greatest lecturers that he could make you cry when in, in, in 250 people talking about the Civil War and its antecedents. And then he took, he, he took students out to dinner. He, you know, who were, he saw as promising students. And if students were in trouble, he helped them out. So when I got involved in protest activity and had to have a fundraising party to pay my legal expenses, <laughs> He also helped steer my dissertation through, um, you know, the, uh, the, the labyrinth. He was like, you know, he was like a surrogate father for me wow. and a, a supporter there in every level, food, solidarity, money. But above all, I wanted to be able to lecture like him. I wanted to have a, a rapt audience 
almost make them feel they were living in the historical period I was talking about. I wanted to bring, be able to bring history to life for my students through storytelling. And that's what I think is the strength of my teaching. That's what I learned from him. I also learned from a young professor who unfortunately died of cancer in his early 30s, Paul Noyes. He, you know, from another professor, Walter Metzger. I had three professors who, who, who lectures were more dramatic, more informative, more entertaining than any play you could ever, or movie you could ever watch. And I wanted to be like them. And then I also wanted to be a mentor to students like Jim Shatton was. Right. You know, so, so I wanted to have the theatricality, but I also wanted to combine it with the individual attention and support. So, I mean, I love my life. I can't retire. I'm having too much fun. <laughs> you know, I have an audience who can't escape. <laughs> but when I start talking at my tennis club, everybody runs away. I had great teachers in, in college, and they gave me a model of how I wanted to be. I'm just trying to, you know, follow the path that they set me on, and uh, here I am. That's great. That's great. Mark, we're coming to the end of our time. That's a great place to stop. But before we let you go to your next meeting, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you want to make sure that you got to say? I think the one thing that I hope that, you know, teachers at Fordham realize the most important thing you can do is make a personal connection with your students on an emotional level especially now in a time when people are hurting and are frightened and are confused. Make that, don't hide behind your subject matter. Show enough of yourself so they can see the human side of you and then trust you enough to express themselves freely, both in their personal commentary, but also their academic work. Take a couple of risks. That's great. Twice Over Podcast is available on SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Spotify, with new episodes appearing twice each week. For host and guest bios and show notes, please visit our website, twiceoverpodcast.com. You can follow us on Twitter at twiceover1 or email us at twiceoverpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.